today in Denver, Colorado, speaking with the person that I would probably describe on paper as a captain of industry or uh, a person that turns businesses around. This is Mr. Robert Noling. And uh, Mr. Noling, you have an illustrious career in business. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that to get started. Well, I was born in Kokomo, Indiana, uh, one of 13 uh, siblings. Wow. And um, difficult um, childhood in terms of uh, not many resources, a um, couple of tours of duty on welfare, and, um, but a tremendous mother that um, to this day still inspires me. Um, all I ever wanted to do as a little boy was to one day go and get a job that would allow me to take care of my mom. And there was a guy in our neighborhood that um, wore a white shirt. And when I say neighborhood, you can imagine our neighborhood uh, is synonymous with the, the projects. Mm -hmm. But he had a white shirt on. Now, I don't know if he went to the local plant or if he went to the bank or if he went down to the water treatment system. No idea, but that was my image. Um, it was the only role model that I had, and that sort of spurred me to want to do something good with my life. I'm child number seven and the first one to graduate from high school. And I remember the day I came home and told my mom that I was gonna quit school because I learned at the age of 11 how to make money. <laughs> you want to share that with us? <laughs> well, I started a lawn mowing business. Right? Right. People, my mom had remarried, people were amazed that on our, the Air Force Base we would have done. Our yard used to get the base commander's yard of the week. And that's because I was meticulous about what I did. And people would ask my mom, well, who did your lawn? She says, my son. And before you know it, I had three lawns and six mm -hmm. lawns. And when I got to ten lawns, I couldn't service them all. So was that, was that a financial motivation at that age? Um, some, somewhat, but also, uh, once I got bigger where I couldn't handle it, um, I hired other kids, and <laughs> I taught them I'm how. To, <laughs> but I taught them how to do it, and if yeah. you didn't do it the way I felt it should be done, because mm -hmm. my job then became inspect the work and also to help you, so I'd make the rounds. Right. And while you're cutting, I'm trimming, and vice versa. I would coach, and if you couldn't do it. The second time after coaching, I told you I didn't need your services. I didn't know it then, but I guess that's the beginning of management for me. Um, so I knew how to make money, and I wanted to be one less burden in the house. So uh, my mother said to me, I'm tired of losing my kids, and that's all the intervention it took. And so I, I finished school, I found athletics, athletics provided access to college, and. When I graduated, I had all kinds of options, um, sports, Fortune 500 companies, just a lot of things to consider, divinity school. Um, and the rest is kind of, um, you know, you, how many people in life actually get to do what they love, you know, a profession. Uh, mine was an ends to, to, to help my mom, so I never even thought about what turns me on. It was all about how do I do enough so that I can take care of others. So you really have a, a really strong belief in altruism. Yes. Yeah. How did your family react to your uh, entrepreneurial uh, ambitions? Well, all the ones who were older than me, except for one sister, they left home early. Yeah. So eventually you become the oldest in the house at 11 years old and one older sister. My younger sisters thought it was pretty cool, but. There's four of them, but none of them wanted to go out and cut yards with me. Um, my brother, who's, a lot, who's probably six years younger, he didn't want to do it, so um, they just, that's Bob being Bob. Well, I, I hate to generalize, but I, I get the impression of usually if you're a, a really rich guy in a, we'll say, a tough neighborhood, you might be perceived by others as being a little bit different. Did that ever happen to you? Sure. Especially during winter season when you would uh, put on your, your mittens and your coat and the same business model applies to shoveling snow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what the heck are you doing with your shoveling snow? Uh, and of course the people that were willing to pay you weren't black people, it was white people. Mm -hmm. 
point, so it became a double uh, negative. Now you're doing uh, manual labor, you're doing it for white people. What's up with you, dude? So you get a, did you get a lot of that, sure. Uh, sure. feedback? <laughs> Paper, right? I mean, my older brother, yeah. he, he wouldn't get up at five and do it. I'm up every morning with my mom at four. And so I went with him one day, memorized the route, and I did it for him. So <laughs> you're really, a, would you describe yourself as an anomaly? No. No. So who, who really are you? If, uh, if I gave you this classic interview question, like give me uh, three adjectives that best describe Robert Nolan. Um, committed. Ever after this interview? Well, I would say <laughs> ethical mm -hmm. and inspired. Okay. By the way, those are not words. That's not what I want to be, but I think that's what people would say. Well, that's very interesting because that's usually my next question. And Robert, we were just talking about the three words that you feel best described to you, and you said committed, ethical, and inspired. What are you inspired to do? What is it you're trying to accomplish going forward, but also looking back? Well, you, in an earlier conversation, we've been, we were talking about goals. And um, I've been goal-oriented since I was 13 years old. Um, it's not because I had that understanding. It was actually a coach who asked me what my goals were for the season, and I had no idea what he was talking about. So I said, I guess to win. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to write down three goals for this season. I want you to put them somewhere where you can see them every day. And then I want you to keep score of how well you're doing towards those goals. And I've now been doing that since I was 13 years old. I usually set them in December. I put them where I can see them. And right. that night when I went home, I convinced my brother Danny to switch beds with me because I had the top bed, he had the lower bed. And that way I could see those goals. Okay, so you lie in bed and then look up. Look at those goals. Very interesting. And you keep doing that to this I day. Do it to this day. And are those annual goals or mm -hmm. so that's kind of the master plan? Well, that's Is that, what that, that 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 it's become such a discipline. It, it makes me commit to something mm -hmm. that I'm going to accomplish, and they're not layups. Uh, they're usually pretty stretched targets, and sometimes they're personal, sometimes they're um, about organizations that I run, so, you know, they run the Can game. you give, give us an example? Something like well, that? the goals for last year was to commit to four weeks of vacation <laughs> with my spouse, which I never do. Uh, the second one was to start a business with my son. I have one son, three daughters. And the third was to do something significant for the school that I went to, um, K through 12. And uh, I did all but one of them. And so we've got new goals this year. So you, can I make the assumption you said you didn't meet one of your goals? Right. How did that make you feel? It's okay. Uh, the goal of starting the business with my son um, didn't happen because he's very sick. Um, in fact, he's on the list for kidney and pancreas transplant plan, so uh, it will happen, but you know, some, sometimes stuff interrupts life. Right. And the uh, most courageous, courageous person I've ever met. This kid's been juvenile of diabetes since he was four years old. He's 27. Had an operation last week where the doctor said, "I got to do these surgeries, or 85 percent chance you're going to be blind in two years." Uh, never hear him complain. Kid's been my hero his whole life. That's, that, it, it seems like you have really strong family roots. That, that that's uh, part of your inspiration. And also a, a pretty deep faith. Mm -hmm. And how do, when you say deep faith, what does that really mean to you? Well, I had a religious experience when I was in high school, and um, I have kept that commitment mm -hmm. since then. And I, I believe that 
I don't care how smart we are, there's somebody a little smarter that's in charge. And I, I give great um, respect and honor to um, the higher authority. And it defines me. It's something I'm not uh, ashamed to talk about. Become more bold with it as I reach the C-suite because that can't be your calling card if you really are in pursuit of the C-suite. There are certain things mm -hmm. you, you have to keep sort of in control. Um, and I think it's especially tough to get to the C-suite if you're a person of color or a woman. But you, you've done it on several occasions. Yes. And how do you account for that? Just the, the will and determination? That, that's some of it. I, first of all, everybody's got a good, strong work ethic that gets to the top. There's enough gray matter that impresses people. I think it's been about delivering performance and not just eking by, but I'm talking Tiger Woods blowout kind of, kind of mm -hmm. performance. Uh, number two, you take a lot of people with you because you don't do it by yourself. So the commitment to other people is first and foremost uh, what I'm about. And I've learned that great results happen when you provide an environment where people can excel. And, and a coach taught me that lesson my senior year of high school. Yeah, I, I'm getting the picture that there are several really strong influential sources in your life and they've really helped determine your path, but you also don't seem like the guy who just sits back and waits for things to happen. No. So where, where does that energy come from? When you grow up as poor as I was, when you've gone through some of the uh, really chilling experiences, being beaten by principal, going weeks without food, seeing racism at its worst, being kicked out of homes, not having any place to go, same pair of pants every day. When you've experienced those things, um, there's enough intestinal fortitude that's at play that affords you the opportunity to really get after things. And nothing that I've experienced in running a business compares to the stuff that I've been through. Okay, well let's talk about that for a little bit. It seems like you've been at a several junctures in your life where you chose the right path, so to speak, the path to success, but I imagine there are others in similar situations that don't choose that path. Why do you think you were so successful in being so focused? Well, I, I never right. knew that it, you, I could be successful. Taking the path was conscious. Um, but success doesn't just happen because you made the right, right turn. Um, and in fact, through my career, the early years of my career, there were never any payoffs, even when I delivered outstanding results. And so I felt the sting of being passed over, um, being marginalized, um, being moved around to solve mm -hmm. really thorny problems, but yet others had a better glide scope. Yeah, is that an organizational issue or is that a, a personal issue? No, that's, that's organizational right. discrimination that exists yeah. everywhere. And it happens to women and people of color. And it's like I tell people, white guys don't come to work every day thinking about how can I make life miserable mm -hmm. for women and people of color. Trust me. The brotherhood of the guys has never gotten together and overtly decided that's the game plan. It just doesn't happen. For a lot of us, a lot of people like to believe that, but that doesn't yeah. happen. What it sounds to me like you've been a victim of microaggression sure. on, on thousands of occasions. What, what's really helpful for me is to understand why some people succumb to that pressure and other people use that as a foundation and an inspiration to try it hard. It's easy to take the, the, the route of succumbing and um, sort of, I've made it, I've, I've, I've gone as far as I can, I've got a good job, 
what, what about her? Mm -hmm. um, and we rationalize it and we get comfortable with it. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. I mean, who the hell wants to put up with some of the stuff that you have to go through? Well, from a you know, cognitive psychology perspective, I tell you that you felt like you were in control. You had the ability to influence the outcome. Is that an accurate interpretation? I would say um, yes. And I never took disappointment home. I never took a job home. There was a real mm -hmm. red line of demark where that was out of limits. Okay. Right. Um, I could not let my kids see um, that there was issues at work, that dad was struggling. I needed to be positive reinforcement, encouragement, hang in there. Um, okay. So yeah, those were all conscious choices. There were many days when I wished I had somebody to confide in, and there were no role models, no mentors. Um, I remember there's a guy I, I wrote about in my book who became a mentor in mid-management. And I remember the day he told me he couldn't take me any farther because he'd not been there and he didn't know how to help me. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, at the top, most CEOs would tell you it is lonely. It's why I'm a big advocate that CEOs need an external coach. you got to have somebody that can, you can yeah. sort of think it through with. One thing that strikes me about everything you've done, even though you said you don't always anticipate success, you seem to have a lot of belief in your ability. You have what we call a lot of self-efficacy for the particular things that you've done. Are there any times that you get kind of discouraged or you know, you lack confidence? Uh, never a lack of confidence, but discouraged, yes, often. Often? And how do you overcome that? Um, that's interesting because I pick up on little things through my life. These coaches I was talking about, my visit to Notre Dame, where the sign that says, play like champions today. Right. Th those little incidents and metaphors and things that I experience, that's the well that I go to every time I'm disappointed. I, I think about where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. I look at the obstacle. And there's really only a left or right choice. Give in, give up or put your big boy pants on and get after it again. And athletics has a lot to do with shaping that in guys and gals that have played at the highest levels. You can't be a great athlete if you don't have a supreme amount of confidence in your capability. Sure. And I know that that's probably mm -hmm. what drives me more than anything. So it sounds like you have some really good emotional control too. Sure, which is something you have to learn. You know, people have accused me of having a pretty even tempered. I don't get really excited when good things happen. I don't get really impressed when bad things happen. I'm just saying, like, okay, it's to be expected. Is that? I mean, sound like that kind of guy. I'm an off the charts introvert. Off the charts, if you look at the Myers Briggs. Um, love solitude. My wife would tell you um, he hardly ever speaks at home. My mother says he works for the phone company and he gets free service and doesn't call me. Um, solitude and renewal is something that I've, I've been practicing for a long time. Well, that says to me that you're highly regulated, that you're not willing to respond to, we'll say, criticism, if you have a plan, you, once you get your sights on something. Am I uh, reading it correctly? Or? Well, um, somewhat. I, I think that the notion of criticism, though, may be, a, may be too How much. How about feedback? Feedback. Yeah, feedback's the most wonderful thing you can ever have as, a, as an individual. And if you can create an environment where people willingly give it to you, it's good. Mm -hmm. As a chief executive, I actually have planned interventions where I take the team off site, not once a year, but usually every month, every other month, where we're dealing with ourselves and doing a, a planned process of right. feedback to each other. Mm -hmm. 
it's really important to be able to accept that you got, and by the way, so what? We all got weaknesses. Some of them we can fix and address, some of them it's just who we are. But knowing what they are, knowing also your flashpoints, mm -hmm. because we all go sure. to dark side behaviors when we get stressed. And knowing what those dark side behaviors are and your stress, if you will, quote, quote, equation, allows you to sort of use your mechanism to stay right. in control. So what's it like to work for you? Um, pretty simple. They will tell you one of the toughest bosses they've ever encountered in their careers. But they will also tell you one of the most motivating, one of the most fair and rewarding people you'll ever meet. Well, you're probably the only, the person in that I've spoken to that really has the most responsibility for others. I've spoken with a lot of individual contributors that have been really successful in their works of life and their domains. But it seems like, at least now, your success is predicated upon what other people can accomplish. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I, I think um, this is interesting. I used to sit in meetings and watch the executives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I would say to myself, because I pick up little good tidbits from some, but it also a big reservoir of things I'll never do. Um, and through that, you then find your own style and your own sort of value proposition in terms of what's important, how you run an organization. If you really want to lead an organization, you have to be an approachable leader. You have to show humility. You have to be a bit self-deprecating. And you've got to give people a belief system that you understand their walk and you've been in their shoes. And I've made that my business every job, every company I've been in. I've been able to do the work of the people that do the technical work in every organization I've ever been in. In fact, I pride myself on it. And the only way you can do that is you got to go and get close to the people that do the work. Now, can you imagine a vice president, an executive vice president, a CEO, out in a truck with a technician, down in a hole with a construction. Well, it sounds like a good leadership model to me, but I think it, that's definitely an anomaly at, at that level. But maybe that's why you're successful, or as successful as you've been. And I know you're being totally modest. You haven't told told us about all the things you've accomplished, and you know maybe that's part of that introverted side <laughs> that you told us about. But I mean, I think. One thing I want to really know more about, you said you try to find out what the belief systems of other people are and work, walk in their shoes. How do you find out what other people's belief systems are? You have to invest the time. And it's not uh, the journal comes to town and walks through. So it's about getting one-on-one -on -one in their space, quality time, not fly-by um, observations. You know, I went down to see the only technician I had in the Grand Canyon. I got there the evening before. Uh, we had dinner, went to his home with his wife. The next day, we spent the whole day together. Then we went to a city function, if you want to call it a city down there, to present a check to the uh, mayor or whatever that little town is. And at 3.30, we went to his home because he told me about new base housing that was coming up, 30 something units, and if he and his wife could get one of those homes, they could put their kids in a better school. He's my only technician there. And to everybody in the Grand Canyon, he is the phone company. And uh, I said, I don't know what it'll take, but I told his wife, if that home is gettable, we're gonna get it for you. Um, we got him that home, but more importantly, I got a chance to meet a wonderful family with great values that did so much for my company beyond what we paid this guy. When I left to go to a new company three years later, he's the guy that, along with several others, said, can I go with you? Um, you? You do this stuff the right way. There's a legion of people that get it, and they see that you're not the politician around kissing babies, but you're interested. The best ideas I've ever had in fixing companies, 
I can be honest, I've never had a great idea. <laughs> I, you don't have to. They'll tell you what's wrong oh, with yeah. the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used I, I, I came to one company and you know, had 40 something thousand people, and uh, I said to my assistant, I'm going to go one night every week somewhere in these states to have a town hall meeting. How many ever employees want to come, come out at 5.30? You know, to 8 o'clock, I'll feed them mm -hmm. hot dogs and pork and beans or whatever. <laughs> and I have never seen so many angry, frustrated, I mean, these sessions were, you would have thought we were in labor negotiations. And I went over to the union my second day on the job and I asked them to go with me. I said, I can't come here and ask you guys to trust me, but I'm just asking you to give me a chance. I'm going to do these meetings. What's the purpose of meetings? I just gotta understand what's going on. I gotta understand how I fix this place. It's a big operating system. I got a lot of ideas, but it doesn't mean anything about understanding this business. Well, you certainly seem to know how to get commitment from other people. That, that's Chris Kay. We're uh, back with Mr. Noling. And while we had the camera off, we were talking about what type of strategies you use to help other people be successful. And you just mentioned, and I, and I love this because we're kind of aligned philosophically, if maybe not behaviorally, but philosophically. You said you you don't sit in an ivory tower office. What do, what do you do differently from a lot of other people? What are the strategies that you use to really be an authentic leader? Well, symbols are very important. And at the level that I am, I need to be in facilities when it's time to meet with other organizations, uh, vendors, um, political people, etc. So there is a need for the proper settings. But in one particular company, I told the CEO I, I won't be in that office um, when I found out about we all had parking spaces. I, uh, I got rid of the parking spaces. Yep. You want to park up front, bring your ass to work at 6 a.m., and you can have one of those spots. Um, so you have to break down all of those stereotypic, which are in fact reality barriers that people see that sort of sets executives apart from the common folks. Now, I, I'm not on a mission to show up other executives. That's not it at all. Uh, but what I am trying to do is to build bridges so that we can properly communicate. And it's sort of like my dealings with unions. Uh, I remember when I went to New York City to do that project for the mayor and the chancellor. I asked permission. Um, and I don't normally ask permission, but I've never been in the public sector. Can I go meet with the union? Because 90,000 teachers, 3,600 principals, assistant principals, I mean, even the principals, administrators were unionized. And I was told good luck. Um, the most wonderful meetings I've ever had because there is a language that you can speak that sort of says, I'm here, I got a peace offering, and oh, by the way, I know that there is no way I can ask for your trust. And so you set a sort of a few ground rules, and sort of my ground rules are as I believe that I, as senior management, have the same objective as unions do. I want the best for my people. Mm -hmm. They don't want slackers on the work. They don't want people that steal. They don't want people that rob, that disrespect customers, that don't do the right thing for children. They don't want that as well. But they exist because management will abuse. <laughs> and so my, my, my rule, and it's my offering, is look, I'll never do anything to the rank and file that we've not discussed. After we've had a discussion, if I've got a point of view that I'm going to implement and we disagree, we will agree to disagree. I will never disparage you in public, and I hope you'll do the same for me. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've encountered your fair share of resistance from your sure. colleagues. How does that work? Don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't worry about it. No. Well, what about when they worry about it? No, but see, that's an, the other problem. I've never wanted to pay attention, and, and I know I've taken flat from other CEOs. When I wasn't the CEO, people used to, what in the hell is Nolan doing? Um, but real interesting in this company I'm talking about, where 
I didn't go to the office. After two years, the head of HR told his HR person that supported my unit. Before they did the salary stuff, all that compensation stuff, go see what Nolan's doing first. <laughs> Is that like unofficial compensation? <laughs> well, because I, I don't be I believe that rules are there because you got to have guidelines. But I believe mm -hmm. Michael Jordan should make more than the other Bulls for his contributions. So I believe in differentiated pay. And I'm a big believer in pay for performance. It's a tough issue to sell in some places, though. So. Yes. I'm sure you <laughs> And that's why you tread lightly as you're moving. Once I became the CEO, I didn't worry about it. It's my company. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I guess that solves any kind of issues of uh, malcontent. If you're uh, rolling out a mutually beneficial program, it doesn't matter what. You seem like you can handle your fair share of uh, well, they, Feedback, we're going to call it. Uh, they, they, they hired a new labor relations guy. You know, 70% of the company reported to me in this one company. And they hired a new labor relations guy that didn't report to me. And my head of HR came in one morning about 9.30 and he says, CEO's looking for you. And so I called him up and I said, what's going on? He says, you know all of your folks in Tucson are out on a wildcat strike. Did you know that? And I said, no. He says, yeah. You, can you check into that? TV stations, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I looked at my HR guy and says, what's going on? He said, let me get right back to you. He came in and he said, the new labor relations guy instructed them to suspend the technician because he wore an offensive t-shirt into the garage that morning. So I got a hundred and something guys are out on the street. So I pick up the phone and I call my union guy down there and he's Michael. I said, yes. Michael, what's <laughs> going on? He said, you dumbass union guy. Telling your people to suspend Joey, and Joey just had that. Joey had no intentions of wearing that into the customer. Yada yada yada. So yeah, everybody's out. I said, okay, Michael, um, get my get my folks back to work. He says, what do I tell them? Am I going to pay him? I says, Michael, get my folks back to work. After you get us back up to work, because you're affecting my customers, you and I will decide. So you didn't tell them what to do. You just said what the goal was. Yeah, get my folks back to work. And you didn't make any suggestions. Didn't need to. Yeah. These guys are smart. They know what to do. And so 20 minutes later, my HR guy comes in and smiles. <laughs> and by the way, I, I then walked over to the labor guy and I said, tell me what possessed you to tell my people to do that. That's my job. That's my job. That's not your job. Your job is to give us an opinion. We don't tell our people to do anything. Now, why don't you go get them back to work since you told them what to do? I walked out of his office. Well, it's, it seems like no, no matter the hurdle, you can uh, overcome it. You bet I can. What, what scares you? Anything? I used to fear that I wouldn't measure up to my coaches, to my wife, and to my kids. But I lost that somewhat, some time ago. Because that's the only measuring stick I've ever held myself to. Well, we're back to those ethics again. I mean, I'm no choir boy, trust me. I got all kinds of issues. <laughs> what should I ask you with the, <laughs> What is the biggest mistake you ever made, and how did you overcome it? <laughs> it's the old HR. You got enough time. <laughs> how about this one? I, I, I used to ask this one all the time. When have you gone against company policy, and why would you not follow the rules that were in place in your organization? Um, I have selectively gone against policies around compensation and discipline, especially when the rules were not good rules. And I did it so I could open up the discussion and the debate to change the outcome. But I never did anything that would quote, because one of the things I learned from a coach a long time ago, you can get great change agents, but kamikaze pilots don't come back. So you gotta make sure that you pick your battles that really are battles that if you lose, you stay alive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've pushed the envelope at times, uh, especially around this compensation systems are one of the things that's really broken in companies. And I, I really hate the peanut butter approach um, I hate these notions of we got to do the bottom 5%. No, you do the bottom. 
it might be 13%, this year it might be two next year. Mm -hmm. So artificial, if you will, expectations have never, never set well with me. So you're not a forced distribution kind of guy? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And you also won't find me heavily skewed to the top. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about how well do people embrace the values, because that's one measurement, and then yeah. The only part of it that's objective is you have a set number of metrics, how did you meet? If you met them all, that's great. If you exceeded them wildly, that's fantastic. If you had a mixed bag, you're either satisfactory or below expectations. So that's objective. Yeah. How well you embrace our values, that's subjective. And I do expect because the values are what we hire from, they're what we, we promote from, and when you don't follow them, that gets you sent home. Why have them if you aren't going to follow them? I'm a big believer that values is the culture and the soul of the company. So I go into, when I've gone into companies, that's one of the first things I do in my first two weeks. Team offsite, let's look at these values. Is that what we want? And I say, okay, let's put these aside. Each of you, write down what are the five, six, seven values that you would have. Don't even worry about this. What do you want? And we put them all up on the wall. Now we got 30 values. All right. Let's figure it out. Let's multi -vote. What do we want? When we get done, we are at a set of values. With consensus. Absolutely. Okay. I'm not going to set it. Central. If you're going to um, lead organizations. First, I believe that you really have to get vested in people's lives. Not, not to the point where you're understanding everything about them personally. But you got to understand what drives them, what motivates them, what are their goals, mm -hmm. what are they trying to do. I've seen so many occasions where we're pushing promotional candidates, and you sit down and really talk to somebody, yeah. they don't even want that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you really do need to come sort of at the, at the issue of what, what are they trying to accomplish uh, mm -hmm. in the job that they're in, in the company that they chose to, to work for. If you help people reach their goals, by default, you have created the perfect scenario for them to get a spring in their step when they leave, to leave the bed every morning. They enjoy coming to work and they give you their best. Mm -hmm. People who are unconstrained and are not feeling the pressures of the bureaucracy, not feeling the pressure of the KPIs, but know that they've got full support. And by the way, we don't set layup objectives. We set half court shots. But they know they're supported. They know that they, and I learned this lesson late in my career. And I said, man, I wish I'd learned this sooner. Jack Welch was my boss for three years. When I, I was just going to ask you about Jack Welch. <laughs> and I met with Jack every yeah. other week. Uh huh. And, and what, what company was that? This was the New York City Leadership Academy. Oh. Yeah. Uh, he was chairman of my board, so right. I met with Jack every other week. And never once did Jack ever tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. We'd discuss something, and he'd say, so what do you think? And then he would probe, and he'd ask questions, and then he would say, what's plan B? But he never told me what to do. I left his office always clear in my thinking, but also owning everything. Well, you had the autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it dawned on me, I wish I had that when I was running companies. Well, you had that when you were mowing the started one more. I did, but he was a master at it. <laughs> he would say he's a master at that, but you know that they have a forced distribution sure. at GE, sure. and the bottom 10% was always whacked out. Well, how does that fit in with your value structure? Well, I think if you were to talk to Jack, I think he had that there for the purposes that I believe something like that should be there. The thing that I, I don't like is telling people what the number ought to be. Um, and I think he would agree with me. But well, it was pretty firm at 10%. Sure it was. I just don't believe in the number. Yeah. And you know the reason why I don't? I think, especially when I've gone to a new company, the number is much higher the first couple of years because dead wood has been allowed to just rot. So what's the secret of communicating bad news? Um, there is no such thing as a, a secret. It, it, it's, it's just being, first of all, try to take emotion out of all that you do when you communicate. I picked up a little lesson from Jack Nasser uh, when he was CEO of Ford. 
he had invited me in to spend a half a day with him and the senior team. It was a great day. Talk to them about how you really lead change. And near the end of the session, I, I asked him a question about, so with this big global company, how do you stay sort of relevant, Jack? Can you, can you test these folks? Every Friday, regardless of where he was in the world, he sent out a message to all the employees. Mm -hmm. And he did it a little differently than the way I did it, because I adopted it every Friday, regardless of where I was. Kind of a recap of what's uh, he, His was written by the corporate communications people. Okay, yours was? I, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and mine weren't corporate speak. Yeah. I remember the first time I had Mother's Day coming up. And that Friday I sat down, and with tears coming down my eyes, I talked about the virtue of women. And the effect they'd had in our lives, the inspiration they'd given us as their children. And I talked about great women in our company. And I said, one of the things you should know is that I don't celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, because I don't need a date to tell me to appreciate my mother and to appreciate my wife. But on Sunday, I want to salute, and, and I had tears in my eyes as I wrote this message. From the heart, probably one of the longest ones I've given. Probably a whole page. You said you're not an emotional guy. That day, I, well, any time it gets to my mother, you can get me emotional. <laughs> That, that woman has given me everything, every advantage in life. She, she, with her whatever, her ninth grade, tenth grade education, she would have been a hell of a CEO. Uh, she's the one person who I will call and sound a problem on. I don't care how technical, um, how financial. You should get her right. <laughs> My mother is awesome. Awesome. It's wisdom, wisdom. You. That's exactly what it is. And by the way, she would never understand it. But she could ask enough questions. She could give me right. sort of, where's your thinking? And she'd say, that's, you're, you're thinking the proper way. Sounds like a wonderful woman. I'd like to meet her, too. <laughs> OK, we've been talking for a while. It's, uh, it's probably time for us to wrap up. Is there anything that you'd uh, like to tell the inspiring, stu the aspiring student of motivation? Any message that you have? I know you've kind of, you've been very forthright and clear as to who you are and how you operate. But do you have any advice for the up-and-coming scholar or manager, leader? Sure. In today's really tough environment? I, I do. For the up-and-coming, the first thing I would tell them is you don't have to have it figured out. Um, meaning job, company, industry, um, how to approach things. You don't have to have any of this stuff figured out. Even if you choose the wrong company, the wrong industry, <laughs> yes. that's OK. Um, I once had a CEO when they finally talked talk me into playing golf. I was pretty intimidated about playing. They put me with the CEO. I'm an athlete, and I didn't figure it could be that hard. But he said something that was real important. He said. Boys, um, I don't mind if you play bad, because I hear two of you haven't played before. Yes. <laughs> Just play bad quickly. And if you make the wrong choice about a company, a career, an industry, mm -hmm. you always learn from don't, it. don't tarry long there. That, that's, that's, those are people who get real frustrated. When you know that you've made the wrong choice, it, there's no harm right. in saying, I, I made the wrong choice. So don't become complacent. That's right. That's right. So you don't have to have it figured out is the first thing. Okay. Number two, I think that you've got to set goals that, well, some of them asked me, so Bob, you, you became a CEO, when, had that been a goal all, heck no. I didn't even know what CEO meant when I was first starting out, first seven, eight years, my what the hell is a CEO? No, you set achievable, quantifiable goals. And I'm convinced that once you've achieved some success, the dream and the goals just get bigger. Trust me, they will. Mm -hmm. But I've seen so many people, and I, I can almost count them on the first day of orientation. These MBAs will walk in, and well, is it seven years or six years before I'll be in the executive suite? 
That's not the right, the right approach. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and but so they're confident. They're very confident. They are confident, but you know they're confident. Highly confident, usually wrong. But they have forgotten the most fundamental thing. Come in and make your mark by being a contributor. Right. As I tell my daughters, yeah. make your contribution so profound, they can't help but have to discuss you. Uh -huh. Whether you want them to or not, they're going to have the discussion. That guy in the kitchen that just gets it done does twice the productivity of anybody else that goes above and beyond the call of duty. You do the job right, you've been in human resources, they will have a discussion about you. Mm -hmm. Whether you get promoted or not is not the issue. They will have the discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that's Visibility. <laughs> so don't have, you don't have to worry about having it figured out. Make your contribution really count and set realistic goals. Fail fast if you're in the wrong industry. Right. That's some really good advice. Well, I, whatever it's worth. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. I, I, and I think you've been very clear in your message, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today.